Since its inception from the Constitution in 1917, the Mexican government has undergone many radical changes in its structure and policies. Beginning in 1929, the Industrial Revolutionary Party, otherwise known as the PRI, maintained control of the presidency for 71 years, all the way until the year 2000. While there were a couple of instances where the PRI lost parts of Congress to other parties, they nevertheless maintained control of the presidency. However, by the end of the 20th century, public opinion of the PRI had deteriorated, mostly due to the economic crisis between 1982 and 1994, as well as the crash of the peso, Mexico's form of currency, in 1994. Of course, now Mexican citizens were looking for a new answer, and as a result, they decided to elect a president from a different political party in the year 2000, Vicente Fox. The significance of Vicente Fox's victory in the 2000 presidential election cannot be overstated. It helped to catalyze Mexico's transition towards a more consolidated, liberal democracy. Fox was a member of the National Action Party, otherwise referred to as the PAN, and ended the one-party rule that had been prevalent in Mexico for over seven decades, finally establishing the country as a true multi-party state. Fox promised to end widespread corruption, raise taxes, and improve the education system, all of which were major issues in Mexican society. Of course though, not everything went according to plan. One of Vicente Fox's plans to end corruption was to focus on paying law enforcement officers and judges more money, so as to prevent them from needing to accept bribes. Obviously, in order to pay people more, the government will have to acquire more funding. The main way to do that? Taxation. Fox had proposed a plan to add 15% value-added tax to both food and medicine, which would have allocated much more money to the federal government, permitting him to achieve his campaign promises. The issue was that, while the presidency was no longer controlled by the PRI, Congress certainly still was, which led to Fox's tax initiatives being shut down. Facing a concerned and increasingly frustrated public, Vicente Fox went back to the drawing board, unaware that the worst was yet to come. On September 11, 2001, four planes were hijacked by Islamic terrorists. Two were flown into the Twin Towers of the World Trade Center in New York, one into the Pentagon, and one crashed into a field in Shanksville, Pennsylvania after passengers successfully fought off the terrorists. The fourth plane was assumed to be aiming for the White House, in a horrific attempt to destroy American society by not only decimating the economy after hitting the Twin Towers, but also inhibiting our ability to respond with force by hitting the Pentagon and killing the president by aiming for the White House. While this tragedy obviously affected the United States the most, Mexico was certainly second in line in terms of being most affected. Vicente Fox had been anticipating economic assistance from the U.S. soon after his successful election, but now the U.S. had much more pressing matters to attend to. Most of the United States money that was meant to help Mexico was now being used to fund anti-terrorism efforts in the new war in Afghanistan. Not only this, but 9-11 also contributed to accelerating the slight recession that the United States was in in the early 2000s, which again would initially not seem like a prevalent issue for Mexico. However, in our increasingly globalized world, recessions in one country affect the rest of the world in a negative way. In this specific instance, the price of oil dropped dramatically from $28 to less than $18 a barrel, which in turn caused both Mexico's economy and Vicente Fox's popularity to simultaneously also drop dramatically. Mexico's government earned much of its income through the state-owned oil company known as Pemex, who virtually had a monopoly in the oil and gas industry. Although oil prices are great for importers like the US, it is detrimental to exporters of which Mexico is one of the world's leading ones. The drastic reduction in federal income from the oil crash combined with the failure of Fox's tax increasing legislation being passed resulted in him not being able to fulfill many campaign promises. As such, his presidency mainly only served the role as the bridge between a more one-party authoritarian government and a multi-party democracy. But this transitionary period wouldn't be over yet. After the uneventful presidency of Vicente Fox, the 2006 election saw another National Action Party candidate be voted into office, Felipe Calderon. Calderon's victory in the 2006 election was very controversial, as he only won by a very small margin, about 0.5% of the votes. The candidate in second was from the party of the Democratic Revolution, otherwise known as the PRD, and they were very unhappy with the narrow margins of the election and believed that they had effectively won. 
As such, they demanded a recount and even protested in Congress by announcing that they would prevent Calderon from taking the necessary oath to be inaugurated. The PRD had a majority in Congress at the time, so they technically did have the power to do this, but the PAN was not going to let that happen. As a result, they took control of Congress for a while to ensure that the PRD would not prevent the inauguration, and as you can likely tell, this undermined the legitimacy of the Mexican government and caused citizens to question the level of democracy. Because of the sketchy start to his presidency, Felipe Calderon announced that he would be declaring a war on drugs and an organized crime within the first month of his presidency. Many saw this as a political move to garner approval and support from the Mexican public, which it did succeed in doing. The Mexican war on drugs is one of the most controversial actions in the government, and is currently still ongoing, and it overshadowed many of Calderon's positive impacts to Mexican society. We'll talk more about it in a bit, but first more about Calderon's other impacts on Mexico. Calderon was able to establish a better and more efficient national health insurance plan for the whole nation, one that applied to anyone who wasn't under any other plan. From the start of his presidency in 2006 to the end in 2012, the number of Mexican citizens enrolled in the plan increased from 15 million to 50 million, a little less than half of the entire population. Calderon also constructed nearly 12,000 miles of new roads and bridges, further expanding the infrastructure of the country and allowing for easier transportation. He stabilized oil production and helped lead Mexico through the Great Recession of 2007 to 2009, in which Mexico had higher employment and economic growth rates than any other countries, even the United States. Of course, all of this was in vain due to the massive widespread violence and slaughtering of citizens caused by the cartels. As mentioned earlier, Calderon's positive achievements during his term as president were massively overshadowed by the tragedies caused by the war on drugs. He ordered the Mexican armed forces to actively seek out the leaders of the cartels and to either capture them or kill them if necessary. While some leaders were captured and were eliminated, those that remained became much more ruthless and began targeting civilians. Before going into all of the horrific details, there is one good thing that came out of the war on drugs, the Merida Initiative, which was a partnership between the US and Mexico to help disrupt large crime organizations and control human and drug trafficking across the Mexico-American border. This agreement was formed in 2007, and a restructuring of it in 2011 provided clearer guidelines for cooperation between the two countries, with the creation of four pillars. The first pillar in the agreement was to disrupt large crime organizations through decreasing drug production and by arresting leaders of the cartels. The second and third pillars aimed to protect citizen security through training law enforcement officers and donating equipment such as x-ray machines for detecting drugs and forensic labs. The fourth and final pillar focuses on educating the youth about drug use and addiction so as to try and prevent the demand for illicit substances, and therefore making the cartels less powerful. Recently, however, Mexico has been trying to get rid of the Merida Initiative due to it being what they refer to as a dead program. The cartels and other large crime organizations did not take too kindly to being hunted by the Mexican armed forces, so they decided to retaliate. In a broader sense, Mexico's rates of violent crime and murder went up dramatically, as clashes between the armed forces and the cartels were frequent. As mentioned earlier, civilians became the main target of the cartels as they tried to spread their message of distaste for the war on drugs. There were many instances where cartels would target public areas such as supermarkets and kidnap or kill many innocent civilians. Mexican citizens became fearful of simply walking alone at any time of the day, because kidnapping and unprovoked murder were so common. One specific incident occurred in August 2011, the fire at Casino Royale in the city of Monterrey in which gunmen infiltrated a packed casino, doused it in gasoline, and set it on fire, which killed 52 innocent civilians. This horrific incident terrorized many Mexican citizens, now realizing that they weren't safe even in public places in broad daylight. Another specific incident also occurred in the city of Monterrey, this one being much more horrific than the fire mentioned earlier. In this incident, 49 mutilated bodies were found piled up on the northern side of the city, bodies of people not associated with any of the large crime organizations. These bodies were found without many of their body parts, including heads, feet, and hands. The victims were kidnapped and tortured for seemingly insignificant reasons, also that the Los Zetas cartel could continue to spread fear and terror throughout the Mexican public. The bodies were so badly annihilated that none of them have been identified, even though this incident occurred almost 10 years ago. Incidents like these led to much public frustration against the Mexican government and specifically against the president, Felipe Calderon. 
While some of the cartel leaders were captured, many others evaded capture and continued to cause chaos, one of them being the infamous El Chapo. El Chapo, in 1989, founded what is widely regarded as one of the largest drug cartels ever created, known as the Sinaloa Drug Cartel. Its main goal was to transport cocaine from South America to the United States, but it also carried heroin, marijuana, and methamphetamines across the border. The cartel utilized a series of air-conditioned tunnels to travel across the border from Mexico to the U.S., making their transportation methods among the most creative of any cartels of the time. He was caught in 1993 and sentenced to 20 years in prison, where he still managed to remain in power. He met with business partners while in prison by bribing the guards to allow him to do so. El Chapo quickly became the greatest drug target in the United States, which even offered to pay $5 million to anyone who presented information leading to his arrest. El Chapo was apprehended in 2014 in a hotel in Mexico, at which point the Mexican president at the time, Enrique Nieto, refused to send El Chapo to the States, saying that he would not be able to escape again. After only about 18 months, El Chapo made a daring escape through a hole in his shower at the prison, crawling through a tunnel over a mile long to an under-construction house. He was captured for the final time in January 2016 after a shootout earlier that day, and was extradited to the United States one year later. In February 2019, El Chapo was found guilty on several counts, and in July was sentenced to life plus 30 years and a $12.6 billion fine. The disapproval ratings of Felipe Calderon soared during the final years of his presidency, and with it, so did the disapproval ratings of the National Action Party. As such, Mexican citizens in the 2012 presidential election decided to vote for a candidate from a familiar political party, the PRI. This candidate was Enrique Peña Nieto. His first order of business was to try and get rid of the gridlock that had been prevalent in the Mexican government since there were differing parties in the control of the presidency and Congress. In order to do this, he created and signed the Pact for Mexico, which was an agreement between the three major political parties, the PRI, the PAN, and the PRD, to pass legislation that had been restricted by gridlock. With this pact, he was able to open Mexico's state-owned oil company Pemex to the private sector and allow outside investment. 2013, this was a controversial decision because Pemex had been a symbol of national pride, since it was the main source of federal income, and one of the largest oil companies in the world, however it did help stimulate Mexico's economy in a major way. Also in 2013, Nieto introduced a plan for education reform, and a plan for tax reform. His plan for education reform included changing the standards for hiring teachers by striking down the National Union of Education Workers, which held the standard for teachers in the country. This union held virtually all control over who was allowed to teach in Mexico. Besides this, Nieto also announced that the census would give detailed information about how many schools, students, and teachers were to exist in a given region. In terms of his tax reform plan, Nieto announced that he would destroy loopholes in the tax system to ensure that most, if not all, Mexicans would pay an income tax, since many of them didn't before this. He also added taxes on capital gains, carbon emissions, and soft drinks to bring Mexico's federal income to a more respectable level. These radical reforms, among other things, meant that Peña Nieto was the most unpopular Mexican president of the last 25 years. This unpopularity led to protests in the capital of Mexico City in 2016 in an effort to encourage his resignation as president. Another major cause for the protests was the event on September 26, 2014, in which 43 students from Ayotzinapa were kidnapped from two buses and presumed to be killed, either by the cartels or the federal government. The students had decided to switch buses to travel to Mexico City in order to join the protests against President Enrique Peña Nieto. What the students didn't realize was that there was almost $2 million in cocaine in the buses, of which the federal government was aware of. To this day, we are unsure if the federal government instituted the mass kidnapping and consequent mass murder, or if the cartels were after the massive amount of cocaine. In the 2018 presidential election, a candidate representing a new party, the National Regeneration Movement, also known as Morena, won the presidency. Andreas Manuel Lopez Obrador was a PRD candidate in the 2006 presidential election, and was the same one who had barely lost Felipe Calderon. He has struggled currently in dealing with the COVID-19 pandemic, but hopefully once the situation subsides, he'll be able to introduce his economic policies.